so here we have this moment where the formerly enslaved are no longer property. By law, they are not property. Um, that was absolutely jarring um, for so many in the Deep South, as well as for some in the North, but in the, in the South. And what you saw were a series of laws that immediately came into place because um, President Andrew Johnson provided almost blanket amnesty for all of the Confederate leaders. So the folks who, in fact, attacked the United States in order to maintain slavery were now back in power after the Civil War. They passed... Um, what are known as the Black Codes. The Black Codes applied only to black people. Um, the Black Codes said that uh, African Americans had to sign la a labor contract, a yearly labor contract, and that they couldn't leave to go to another job. They had to stay with that employer, no matter how brutal, no matter how horrific the working conditions, no matter what kinds of wages were being uh, paid. It said that African Americans, if you did not sign a labor contract, um, you could be arrested and charged with vagrancy. And then a plantation owner or a mill owner could then pay your fine, and you would have to work off your fine um, by basically indebting your labor to this plantation owner. Um, it denied African Americans the right to own weapons so that they could not hunt or fish. Um, that way, they couldn't stave off starvation, and so they would have to go and, and work in one of these areas um, for one of these brutal employers. It was a way to reinscribe slavery. How did, I mean, you know, I, I, ima I, mean, I imagine people are asking themselves, like, well, how, I don't understand. How did this, how was this legal? How could you pass this laws? Where, where was the recourse? And, and they could pass these laws because Andrew Johnson was um, a Democrat from Tennessee who believed that this war was only about... Um, uh, preserving the Union. It wasn't about slavery. And so the moment that the Union had been preserved, he did not care about uh, four million freed people. And as I said, he provided amnesty. Now, Congress is on recess at the time. When Congress comes back, Congress said, what did you do? And, and Johnson says, I saved this nation. Uh, and Congress is like, that doesn't look like saving, uh, because they're, they're, there's mass killing happening. The legal system provides no shelter for African Americans. They can't testify in court, um, again, in the black coats. They can't testify against whites. Um, and so you have this massive battle between Congress and the and the White House on who was going to control Reconstruction. Under Andrew Johnson, not only did you have the sanctioning of the black coats, but you also had the stripping of 40 acres and a mule, which was the means to provide some level of economic sustenance, sustenance for um, 4 million freed people. And understand that this isn't land given to the slaves. This is land that is going to be leased to them. Mm. It's not like the Homestead Act that Johnson fought so hard for, which was to give 160 acres to poor whites. Um, but this is where blacks would have to lease 40 acres. He rescinded that and had federal troops remove um, black people from the land. And this is land that had been abandoned by the plantation owners. So the next piece that I look at um, is the Great Migration, because here you have black people basically saying, I am getting ready to take control of my own destiny. I'm leaving the South, and I'm going to go work up north where the wages are a lot better than what I'm dealing with here, where there appears to be a functioning legal system so that I don't have to deal with all of the lynching that is happening. And we should tell people we're, we're talking now basically from the early 1900s, I mean, I guess theoretically through uh, the, uh, the mid-20th century, and maybe even, uh, the, I mean, when does the, the Great Migration technically end? Yes, yeah, so you have the first wave of the Great Migration, which is about 19, 
15 to 1940, and then you have the second wave of the Great Migration, which I don't really cover in the book, um, which goes during the Second World War and takes us up until about the mid-1960s. Okay. And again, you have black people pouring out of the South because the jobs are really up north, because better pay is up north. And, and part of what we understand is that in the United States, you have the right to take your labor elsewhere. You have the right to take your labor to a better employer. Um, what happened during the Great Migration, and this is when the U.S. is in the First World War and fighting to make the world safe for democracy, um, is that you had governments in the South, like in Jacksonville, uh, Florida, like in Georgia, passing laws banning African Americans from leaving the area to go get a better job. And, and, and saying that they will be, if they're found guilty, they will be incarcerated, where they will have to work off their labor. So basically a way to enslave again. And so think about that. You cannot leave Jacksonville, Florida for a better job. Mm. <laughs> um, and, and they banned, you know, we talk about First Amendment rights. They banned the Chicago Defender. Um, because the Chicago Defender was a massive um, conduit of information about jobs and housing up north. And so you have municipality after municipality banning a newspaper in order to shut down the flow of information. Now, if that sounds like behind the Iron Curtain, it is. But this is what's happening in America while the U.S. is fighting to make the world safe for democracy. You also have them stopping trains, physically stopping trains. So they would pull people off of trains, um, uh, uh, black people off of trains, just to keep them from migrating. Absolutely, absolutely. And they were charging labor agents who were the um, labor recruiters from the north, they were charging them licensing fees up to $25,000, and this is in like 1917 dollars, <laughs> um, $25,000 for a license um, to be able to recruit labor. And if, they did, if the labor agent didn't pay that fee, then the labor agent could be um, found guilty and thrown in jail. So, so in the context of the migration... Mm-hmm. Was the uh, were the impediments to uh, migrating? They they seem to be coming both from the um, um, the point of departure and the point of arrival. Yes, and that was the the problem with the North. The North was no promised land. It was no paradise. Um, the racism had been l- less obvious simply because 90% of all black people lived in the South at the time. But what the Great Migration did, 10% of the black population, um, in fact, moved north. And that is a massive migration. It would change the, the electoral and demographic map up, up, up north. But what they faced were massive housing, is housing discrimination, for instance. Um, like in Detroit, I talk about the case of Dr. Ossian Sweet, who um, moved to Detroit after getting his medical degree from Howard. And, but Detroit, although the black population had increased within the span of a few years by 10 times its original number, mm. the area where black people could live did not expand. And so imagine putting 10 times the number of people in the same um, square footage, square, square miles, um, and the housing conditions were awful. Um, in that area, known as Black Bottom, by the way, um, half of the homes had outhouses. Mm. We, you know, so we're, we're thinking of the north, and you've got indoor plumbing. Not right. in Black Bottom. <laughs> Not in Black Bottom. Um, and so Ossian Suite was, you know, I, I, I work hard. I've got my medical degree. Um, I want to raise my my daughter in a in a decent neighborhood that's not loaded with outhouses and and the kind of poverty where uh, landlords absentee landlords are charging exorbitant exorbitant rents 
for ramshackle housing that they refuse to reinvest in. So, so, so there's obviously, uh, you know, at this time, no real legal recourse because it's difficult to get into the courts. You need uh, some, you need, you need lawyers. <laughs> you need lawyers who are willing to take clients who are not going to be able to pay them in many instances. Uh, and you uh, need courts that would even allow, would even be willing to hear these cases uh, to challenge some of the underlying laws that are, that are involved here. How explicit from the point of departure uh, and uh, uh, also the point of arrival were these uh, how explicit were the motives and the intent expressed so i mean explicitly okay <laughs> explicitly so um in the in the ossian sweet case for instance the, the the michigan supreme court prior to his moving into uh, off into the Garland Avenue home where all where the violence would break out um, is that the Supreme Court in 1922 in the Parmalee decision said that residential segregation um, is in fact constitutional um, and that it was okay for homeowners associations to do what not to say to do whatever it took, but they did do whatever it took to keep their neighborhoods white. You had the rise of these homeowner associations masked in the language of protecting property values, uh, because that's also one of the ways that white rage works. It doesn't just say, ah, you know, we hate black people. It, it masks a lot of what it does in the language of democracy, in the language of everything that just sounds reasonable. And that's where we get to issues like voter ID, where we are right now. 